And hey everyone, um, welcome to another IoT Live. Um, as normal, uh, I'm Pete Codes, Pete Gallagher uh, in real life. Uh, beside me I've got uh, the awesome Cliff Aegis, um, hey everyone. who is actually in the country for once, which is nice. I am, at the moment, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and then uh, right next to Cliff, uh, we've got Jake Cohen. And now is it Cohen or is it Cowen or is it Cohen or, you know, you might as well let us know which one of those is. I probably should have asked before, but... <laughs> Uh, Cohen. Cohen's correct. Cohen, yeah, that's good. Yeah, well, I started with that, so you have to take my first answer anyway. That's how it works. Uh, so, I mean, tonight is uh, well, at least the first thirty minutes. Uh, Jake um, is from Microsoft, from the Lobe AI team, um, and he'll be joining us for the first thirty minutes to talk about what it is that um, he's doing at Microsoft. Uh, and to give us a few demos and things like that, and then um, when when Jake's uh, gone on for the rest of his day, then we'll we'll do uh, the sort of the stuff that we'd normally do as well around uh, news in IoT and what we found and stuff like that as well. So uh, this was always planned to be uh, about Lobe, but I managed to collar Jake. I just sent him a message and said, "Do you want to come on?" And he very kindly said yes. Uh, so uh, that turned out quite nice. We we're just talking just off air there about how easy it is to 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 network now at this point uh, with. Uh, video conferencing and stuff so it's handy for that uh so i mean before we go much further jake do you want to just say who you are what it is you do and, and all those good things yeah for sure yeah thanks for having me on the show uh this is super fun uh, my name is jake uh, i'm a program manager at microsoft and i work on the lobe team and we're building uh, an app uh, that makes it really easy to train custom machine learning models uh, and i'm super excited to share that with you all and we also just released and partnered with adafruit to release a machine learning kit uh, that you can use to uh, deploy machine learning models to and and use them in really cool ways. Uh, so we'll be going over both, and uh, it's going to be really fun. Looking forward to it. Uh, and uh, I've, I've managed to have a play. I mean, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll have seen the great long thread of of me playing with this exact kit. Uh, and I think it was uh, as a result of that that you contacted me and said, do feedback, uh, which was a good thing. That was very nice of you to do. Uh, so, yeah, that, that great long thread of me playing with this this new uh, Braincraft hat specifically with the Raspberry Pi and Lobe. Is, it was really good fun, actually. Um, there, there was quite a lot of steps uh, to go through, uh, which we'll no doubt speak about in a bit. Uh, but the tutorials were really good and um, you know, thorough instructions uh, to get you up and running. And uh, Lobe itself, the tool, is, is awesome. Uh, and on that note, I mean, do you want to want to speak a bit about what Lobe is and and how that works yeah. and obviously you could fire yourself into whatever demos that you feel drive that story forwards as well but um yeah feel free to to do whatever yeah takes your fancy. for sure yeah let me i'll share my screen uh just our, our website so lobe is a free easy to use app that you can use to train custom machine learning models uh it's available for both mac and pc uh, so you can download and get started uh, it doesn't require any experience to get started uh, so don't feel intimidated about machine learning. You can download and get started. There's no coding required. Uh, all you need to do is add images to Lobe, and it will automatically start training a model for you to recognize what objects uh, things are in pictures. Uh, you can train completely for free on your own computer. Uh, so there's no sign up or cloud training or any, any cost involved. Um, and you can export your model and ship it on any platform you'd like. Um, and so a lot of opportunities here. And so here's our website. You can check this out and, and download Lobe for free um, and, and get started. Uh, and second, we, we just announced uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, as Pete queued up, uh, this machine learning kit uh, with Adafruit. And we're super excited about this because this gives you the opportunity to see how you can not only train a model in Lobe, but then deploy it to a Raspberry Pi with a camera and actually use it to detect things and do things like notify you and give you alerts if something's happening. And so we've got three tutorials with the kit that you can walk through to learn all about Lobe. Uh, you can learn all about the Pi and getting started. And uh, we have some intro tutorials. But then all the way in the end, you can learn how to train a model to automatically detect when a package is at your front door and text you or email you. Uh, but that can be extended to like any type of use case. Like You can train a custom model to alert you if your dog's at your backyard door and it needs to be let in, or if there's a bird at your bird feeder, or if there's like a parking spot open on the street that's your favorite spot that your neighbor keeps stealing. But you can really think about whatever you'd like and um, train a custom model to do that task for you. Uh, it can also be used in the same sense for uh, work scenarios as well. So anything where you can set up a camera and you want to be 
alerted or notified if something is happening, or just to be monitoring things. Like you can monitor the store engagement, uh, people walking in and out, uh, if someone's not wearing a helmet in a danger zone, things like that. So a lot of really creative things you can do uh, with a live camera, as well as reviewing uh, images uh, and making making predictions. So you, you say about you, you say about it sounds awesome. I'm like hooked already. Um, you say about sort of training the model easily on your computer, and you say about uploading a few images. When I kind of looked at AI, and admittedly it was a, a wee while ago, um, it was you had to upload like sort of thousands of images, you had to classify them and say, this is an image of this, this is a good one, this is a bad one, you know, and this was just something as simple as, you know, hot dog or not kind of, you know, the sort of atypical kind of AI training thing. Um, I must admit, I got bored very quickly in tagging images and, and uploading them. So how is this different? Yeah, so it's a great point. Uh, machine learning does require a lot of images to train with and get started. Uh, what Loeb is doing that's uh, pretty cool is we're using a technique called transfer learning. And so we use pre-built trained state-of-the-art models that are great at predicting common objects and things in the world. And when you use Loeb, you'll train a custom model on top of that model and you add your specific images that are tailored to your specific use case or uh, domain. Uh, and it will train on top of that. And it makes the training process much faster and the ramp up speed much faster. Uh, and so what's cool about Loeb is you can, and I'll demo this in just a bit, um, you can get started very quickly, uh, and you can just go ahead and test and deploy your model uh, and see how it's doing and then improve it from there. So you can get from prototype and stand up to deployment and use uh, much faster uh, than, than in other, other tools and um, way of doing it. So you train the model on a, a bigger machine, like your laptop, your desktop, you know, uh, that sort of thing, and then you download it into a smaller computer like the Raspberry Pi for doing the kind of you know camera capture and stuff like this. Um, That's a or, great or, question. Or, yeah, you you can actually use the model really anywhere you'd like. Um, so the Raspberry Pi okay. is one use where you can use machine learning on the edge or you know on, on a small computer, but you can also use the model on your computer. You can uh, deploy it to an iPhone or Android app. You can deploy it to a website. Wow. You can to the cloud. So there's a bunch of options and where you want to use the model. It just depends on your particular use case. But you're not bound or kind of restrained or you know, to, to a particular um, use. So when you use the model, is it like a, a TensorFlow model? Or I don't know many of the others. I'm not an AI expert. But um, <laughs> is that the sort of thing you're using? We're using all of the standard, you know, industry standard formats. So TensorFlow, uh, CoreML uh, for Mac and iOS, uh, Onyx as well. Um, and uh, and other versions of TensorFlow. So there's TensorFlow Lite yep. uh, for, for, for Edge and mobile devices, and TensorFlow JS is, uh, is sort of browser for the web. JS. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Gives me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> I mean, uh, Jake, I guess you're going to be going through some of this anyway. Um, I, I'm assuming if you're going to do any form of training with Loeb, then you're going to export that model and put it somewhere. Yep. Uh, this this kit allows you, certainly with the, the Adafruit, uh, or Adafruit Braincraft hat, then you're going to put it on a Pi, so you copy it down to the Pi and then it uses it. But it's just it's very simple, isn't it? You just literally export the model uh, as a TensorFlow Lite in, in that particular example and then copy it to the Pi and, and spin up some Python and and you're off and yeah. running. Yeah, we're trying to you know reduce the complexity around putting models to use and getting, getting started with machine learning, so you don't need to get into the weeds of um, all the technicalities and all the um, specifics, you know, we, we try to make it as easy as possible to export, deploy, and, and run. Um, so let me give you all a, a little look at the Adafruit site. This is where you can uh, get the machine learning kits. Uh, they're actually pretty low in stock. There's two left for the Raspberry Pi 4, and um, they're out of stock for two gigabyte. But if you already have a Raspberry Pi, you can get the kit that does not include the Pi. That includes uh, this nice uh, Raspberry Pi um, Braincraft hat that Adafruit made. That includes a nice screen, so you can see what the camera sees, and a lot of um, I/O, so buttons, um, inputs, outputs, things like that, uh, and the camera, of course. So you can, um, yeah, use that camera to see. And here's a little look at uh, what all the kit includes. So if you are a maker today, if you already uh, use Raspberry Pis and you're looking to get started with machine learning, this is a great place to start with Loeb and uh, combine your expertise with the with the Raspberry Pi and start getting used, uh, you know, start using machine learning. So let's jump ahead to, and go to a demo. Uh, well, so just to show in advance. 
What I love about all this is the, the unblocking that you're doing with a really complicated subject that, that Cliff kind of alluded to there in uh, any form of uh, machine learning, and, and you can quite quickly get down into the into the data science side of things without even having to think too much about where you're going, and then get stuck. Uh, but this is taking you out of that and um, uh, yeah, unblocking that, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. So here's the um, the kit all set up. You can see on my screen, uh, and this is running. Um, and we'll get ready to throw some models on here pretty soon. Um, so we're going to go ahead and use this camera. It's facing down on my desk. And we'll use this to in load to collect images. And then we'll um, put the model on the Pi and, um, and test it out there. And we can see the screen to see what it's saying. So move this off to the side for now. And uh, just to do a very simple, quick demo to start, uh, we're going to train a model to detect common objects on my desk, uh, just to get a feel for what machine learning is like and what Loeb is like. So we'll go ahead uh, and open Loeb uh, and start a new project. And we'll just call this, uh, let's call this desk objects. And so the first step uh, in training a model in Loeb is to add images of things you want it to detect. Uh, so we can go up here to import and add some images. Uh, and you can add images you already have in your computer, or you can use your webcam to collect brand new images, uh, which is a really fun way to get up and start it quickly. And if you have a structured folder of images, uh, you can also import that with labels already assigned. We'll go ahead and use the camera. We'll see which camera this is. All right, great. So this is using my desk. And let's go ahead and collect some images. So I'm going to first uh, take some pictures of uh, this pen on my desk. <laughs> and we'll go ahead and put this here and just take a picture of it. And that's already getting started. We're going to go ahead and move this around a few different angles. But then we'll go ahead and take a burst of images where I can just press and hold on this button and collect a bunch of images really quickly. So let's just go ahead and do that. <laughs> and switch hands. I like the bings and, and so the what I'm doing. It makes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just getting a little bit of variety, different angles, different directions, uh, so it gets an idea of what uh, a pen looks like. Uh, next, we'll go in and add a plant. So I've got this nice little cyclone on my desk. So I'll go ahead and take a picture of that. And this actually kind of looks pretty similar in different angles, but let's still go ahead and twist that around. And then I can go ahead and pick this up and kind of show it the sides and uh, let it know what it looks like. All right, that's good for now. Could you do this with video, or has it got to be still images? Today, you can uh, turn a video into frames and import those frames. Okay. Um, we don't natively support video, but, uh, but we'd like to. Yeah. Uh, next, I'm going to take a picture of a sticker. So let's go ahead and add that. Nice, cool little lobe sticker. Take a picture here. Let's go all angles. Get this started. And then uh, let's go ahead and do burst mode for this as well. Show different angles. So is that you just holding the button down there and it's doing a burst mode, is it? In lobe. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it makes it a little bit faster to, to collect images. Now, it's super important in the end to add uh, a variety of images. You don't really want images that are super similar. Otherwise, it can do something called overfitting, uh, which starts to learn some of the similar features between those images too much. And it you know, ends up focusing on that more than just the general. So I'm going to actually take pictures of different stickers. So it learns like what a sticker is versus what one sticker looks like. Six pictures there. All right, cool. And then last, this isn't super intuitive to start, but we also need to teach our model what it looks like when it sees nothing. Um, and so a model and image classification always makes a prediction of something it sees. Uh, so we're going to teach you what it looks like when it doesn't see a pen or a plant or a sticker. So we'll just call this nothing. I'll take a few pictures of what it looks like just like this, but I can also hold my hand view because I'm using my hand to hold the object. So it's kind of learning that my hand doesn't mean it's an object. Um, otherwise, if it sees my hand, it might train seeing my hand in maybe a lot of pen pictures and think like, oh, that might mean pen. Huh. Uh, so that looks pretty good so far. Uh, we can go back and view all, our, view all of the images all in one place. Um, and we can go here to all images on the side and uh, actually look at your data set. It's also really good to be familiar with the images you're training with to get a sense for what it's seen and what it's not seen because a model only learns from the images you give it. 
Uh, so we can kind of scroll through here and see how these pictures look and make sure we've got good representative data for each class. Uh, the next amazing thing about Loeb is training happens automatically uh, without any configuration needed. Uh, so you can see right here that Loeb is getting started uh, to train our model and we'll kick off in the background and uh, do all the complicated things for us. So we'll go ahead and let that train while, uh, while we wait and get that set up. That's what the uh, different ding was in the background there that I heard. Um, I didn't know what it was doing when I first saw that. And then it knows it's, it's doing it, in fact, what I was just about to say, where it, it tells you how much of it is getting incorrect even. What, what is it actually telling that's right, us that's there? Right. What's that, what is that message telling you? Yeah, so if we go to the train tab, you can see live results of how training is doing over time. So you can see and kind of get inside the black box and see what your model is thinking at, at this time. Uh, and so Loeb is training. It's continually looking at these pictures. It's making a guess at what it thinks it is. It's being told if it's correct or not. And it's making fine tune, tune it's tuning the model. And it's making fine adjustments uh, to get better the next time around. So this is a repetitive process that goes through over and over again and gets better at finding what a picture, what picture is what. <laughs> um, down here in the corner, you can see out of all the images we've added, how many of them the model is predicting correctly and incorrectly at that time. So right now, the current model is predicting 74% 74, 74 of our images correctly, 26 incorrect, and you can see which ones it's getting confused with. Um, you can see this is still pretty early, so it's seen a lot of these that thinks it's pen. Uh, it's quite possible that the model is just overfitting and thinking, hey, maybe everything is a pen. <laughs> so let's start with that. You can see that as a common trend in um, machine learning models, especially small data sets. Uh, so this is going to continue to uh, go on and improve, and uh, we'll see better results over time. Um, and then we'll be able to um, test it out inside Love as well. I like this it. is super clever. It's just and you, dead you, you only took. You only. I was going to say you only took like hundred. I think it was hundred ninety-four images. I think it was, wasn't it? Over what a matter of yeah, minutes. You, yeah, you can technically train uh, with just five images per class, but we recommend you know uh, more than that. Fifty to hundred is a good way to get started, uh, and then really. Um, the more the merrier, but it really depends on what your use case is, where you're using the model, and how it's performing in the real world. Because um, the reason you want, um, yeah, you want to add representative data on what the model will see when you're putting it to work. Um, so if you've got a model you're using at your front door that's detecting when there's boxes, uh, like packages left there, mm -hmm. you want to train, you want to collect pictures over time uh, with different weather conditions, different lighting, uh, different objects when people walk by, when there's your dog there, your pet, like different things that might not have ever seen before. So it doesn't get confused with that. Um, so, uh, yeah. Very clever. Yep. I think uh, I, when I was doing it, I think I did 20, 20, 21 images of each, and it was it was pretty darn accurate just with 20. Uh, so, yeah, yeah it, was, it was impressive. I was impressed. I'm going to go ahead and add a couple more pictures of plant. Help that one out. And you can see on the side, we have recommendations for how many images you should have per class. The typical recommendation is to have a balanced data set, so the same number of images per class um, is usually um, usually a good idea. Is that that overfitting problem it. you were talking about? Or the more images of one thing there is, the more likely it is to choose that thing rather than something else? Or? That, that's right, yeah. And you know there are data sets that you would want uh, an unbalanced data set because in the real world, there may be more way more of one thing than another. Mm -hmm. So you don't want it to have an equal weight, uh, equal kind of likelihood of, of what it might see. But um, it depends. Mm -hmm. So we've added some more images. It's going to continue training. Uh, let's see if we can get this model a little bit better. I think uh, my computer's running a little slower with all these cameras running. <laughs> Just while you're waiting for that, I'm not sure if you've got the uh, the chat up on the uh, on the uh, the Twitch stream there, uh, Jake. But uh, there's a, a question in from Rick B. D. Bosch. Uh, is there a need to tell yep. the model what the interesting part of the Im image is, since the background now is the same everywhere, or is it smart enough to see the background in all images and exclude this from that because of that? Okay, I can't read. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and so this is where the nothing class really helps your model improve. Um, so when you train uh, a class that has nothing in it and it, the background is the same, it can start to learn that that background is not unique to a particular label like pen or plant. Um, it will know that when there's, it, it'll basically start to realize that that 
that part of the picture is not an important feature or characteristic for it to help determine is this a pen or not, or is this a plant. Um, so it is useful to add a variety of backgrounds, a um, variety of uh, lighting conditions and different factors to help your model get better uh, at not seeing you know, things in the wood and thinking that that is uh, what something means. So for smaller data sets, it, you can fall into that trap where uh, it might be actually seeing something else that you don't, wouldn't even think of um, and thinking that that's what uh, a pen is. So now you can see the model's much better. It's predicting 99%, uh, which is fantastic. Oh, um, and we'll, next, we'll go to the use tab uh, and really test this model out. So it's getting 99% of our, the images we've uploaded correct, but that's, your, that's the images you're training with, so it gets a chance to retry. Um, now we can really see how it's doing, so it sees nothing here. I can add a little sticker. And you can see when it saw my hand, it was a little confused with pen at first, but now I can see sticker. And this is uh, the confidence level, so it's very confident that's a sticker. I can try another one. And next, let's try pen. There we go. Now, what's really fun here is you can really test your model uh, in a lot of different ways and, and play with it and see how it's working. Uh, so we can see that this is getting planned correctly, which is awesome. But let's try something unique, like let's show it a different pen. I train with a black pen. Let's see what happens when it sees a red pen. OK, it thinks that's a pen, which is technically correct. But it's also, maybe it's the most similar thing to pen before. So that's why it thinks it's a pen. Let's try this pencil. OK, still a pen. But now this is a fun one. Let's see what happens when I put these AirPods down that I've never shown it. Huh. Sticker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it could be that the features in the sticker that show the white boundary, maybe it sees white, and it just thinks that that white means, hey, if I see white, it means sticker. Yeah. So it, this is a really great place where you can test your model live. You can test it on new images as well. You can use this tab and drag in images you got from the web that you've collected in a previous time and um, test your model and improve it. So uh, you can also improve it uh, live here. I can click this red button down here and say this is not a sticker. Uh, this is actually nothing. Maybe we want to say that, you know, if you see anything else, just assume nothing. It's kind of like the not anything else class. Mm -hmm. um, and as you add more pictures of that, it'll start to learn, hey, I see this white thing, but it's actually nothing. OK, so I won't know that white means nothing. So um, it's the magic of machine learning. The more data you give it, the more it can learn and refine and tune uh, what is what. You're saying that reminds me of Westworld. Have you watched Westworld? Uh, so that's not actually. About, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's really good, actually. But there's a part, there's several parts in that where the androids, as you will, the the AI androids, they if they don't understand what they see, then they're trained to say, "I saw nothing," or "There was nothing there." So it's like they they don't see. It. So that, when you've just said that, it's like, ah, okay. I wonder if this has got like a a basis that because obviously they do research. So I'm guessing that this is a machine, mm -hmm. uh, this is a data science concept you're talking there of nothing where, you know, as you've just said, you have to consciously train your model to know about nothing or, or nothing of interest, I suppose, as you said with the AirPods thing, um, as, a, oh, as a way of yeah. being able to draw us a line in the sand to say, look, you just need to stop treating these images as anything else. This is definitely not interesting. It, it's, yeah, I'd not, I'd not thought of that until I started going through this process. And it was like, why am I taking photos of nothing mm -hmm. here? I don't quite understand, but obviously it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Huh. Yeah. So, so next I'll quickly show you, um, you can go to the Export tab and choose from a variety of different options. We've got all the different model files, so TensorFlow, Onyx, TensorFlow JS, CoreML, and TensorFlow Lite. Uh, we also have a bunch of starter projects on GitHub that we're starting to um, add and improve. We have a REST server, uh, we have a web app, an iOS app, and an Android app. These are really um, quick and easy starter projects that you can uh, export your model to an app and deploy it on your phone uh, and, and get started there. So if you want to build an app uh, and use machine learning, this is a good place to get started. Uh, we also have a, a .NET um, library or SDK you can use to make it easy to use machine learning mo uh, low models in .NET uh, apps. And um, we also have a Python library to make that easy. But I know I've got six minutes till I got to run. So let me jump <laughs> over to showing you it on the kit because this is the fun part. Let me bring this back into view. And so um, once you have this all set up and running, uh, you can connect to your Pi wirelessly uh, using SSH, which I have connected here uh, using Terminal. And then I've got this other app uh, called FileZilla but uh, for, for FTP. So it's to uh, help manage your files between two sources. 
Uh, so this I can drag files from my PC and my Mac, or my Mac and move it to my Pine. Uh, and I've got this folder here called model. Um, this is what happens when you export a model. You get these files here and you can drag these in uh, to your Pine. And then on our GitHub, that comes along with the kit. Uh, you can download all the code that we have there. It's starter code and sample code to get you started. I can jump in here. We've got these different Python scripts that you can run to uh, try different things. So let's start by running the uh, low basic capture. Let's see, I gotta go to on three. Oh, I gotta first see where we're at. I gotta go into the folder. There we go. Here's all my projects. I can run low basic prediction. And what this is going to do is run some code that will show me the prediction um, it's making for what it sees. So right now you can see it's making uh, the prediction nothing. If I bring in a sticker, you'll see the prediction sticker. So this is just kind of visualizing what the model sees, what the camera sees. And uh, another way to test your model like we did in low, um, but on the Pi. Nice pen. So that's cool. <laughs> But let me jump over to another project I was working on, uh, rock, paper, scissors. So we have another project where you can learn how to create a rock, paper, scissors game on your Pi and play against it. So I've got this project I already made, rock, paper, scissors, pictures of each class. And I'm going to move that model over to my Pi, and we're going to play against the computer. So let's do that next. <laughs> So I'm just going to override my previous model on the Pi. Make sure that's off. Yeah. We'll let that finish, and then we'll uh, we'll play rock paper scissors. <laughs> Such and an then, awesome idea. Well, that's loading. <laughs> What's that? Such an awesome idea. Uh, to uh, it's a different use, isn't it? Of uh, rather than just classifying something and and doing the normal sort of yeah. stuff. Play rock paper scissors is a good idea. Yeah, so let's now, I think the model moved over, so let's go ahead and we can instead run uh, low rock, paper, scissors. And kind of do the same thing right now, I'm just holding the camera up. But what I can do is press this button right here and put my hand up and it's gonna first look at what you're making, make a prediction, it says scissors, that's correct. And then computer did rock and unfortunately we lost. <laughs> I'll try again. That's because it knows what it is now. It's deciding afterwards, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. No, 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 it's not. It's randomly picking. But Scissors. <laughs> we win. Woo. Nice. Nice. <laughs> so that's super fun. And then the third demo we have, I just have a video of it. Um, here I've got the Pi taped up above my door. This is just in my apartment to test. But what I'll show you is me dropping a package off and then getting a text notifying me that a package is at my door. <laughs> Let me play that real quick. So here it says no package. That's correct. Come by. Drop off a package. You can see it's now seeing the package. And then I get a little notification saying you got a package. <laughs> That's cool. I like that. I know if we got. I don't know good. if we if we got Johnny Chips in the chat. I can't remember if uh, if I saw him there when I was looking. But one of his next projects is to. Yeah, to... yeah I don't have Twitch open. Let's check it out. After. He's, he's yeah. not there at the moment. No, that's a shame. He's going to build himself a cat flap. Uh, that you know, an automated cat flap with the uh, AI that can open his cat flap for just the right cat. And I've seen that done a couple of times. That's a. That's a good thing to do. Uh, I'm conscious you've got one minute left. So I just wanted to, before you leave, thank you very much for taking the time for yeah, uh, thank your you. day to, to come and share yeah. us. Uh, it's such a cool project. And do obviously uh, come back soon and, and, and bring us up to date with whatever new uh, features you've implemented along the way and um, keep keep up the hard work. It's You've made an awesome product along yeah. the way. So congratulations to you. And yeah, the team. yeah, it's been fun to be on the show and uh, be down to chat more. I wish we had a chance for more questions, but... Uh, for anyone on the stream interested, check out uh, lobe.ai, our website. You can download for free. Check out the kit um, and let us know if you have any questions. You can email us at uh, lobeai at microsoft.com if you have any feedback, questions, thoughts, ideas, um, and um, I'll be happy to chat. Ah. So it's been fun, guys. Ah, thank you very much, Jake. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah.
See you yes, later. Mate. See you guys. <laughs> See you. Bye, Jake. So that was Jake. Uh, that was awesome. Um, uh, it's really, really good of Jake to come along as well and, and take the time out of his day. Uh, and it's always to get. It's always cool to get somebody who's in that team working on the product uh, to come along and, and show us what they're working on. Uh, uh, so it's and it's it's really cool. I mean, I've, I've uh, over the weekend I managed to get mine set up down here. So if I switch to my screen, uh, then hopefully that's virtually live down there. You should be able to see. Uh, mine's categorizing nothing at the moment because it's just pointed at nothing. But if I point it at my pen, then uh, it's actually quite difficult to see that. But it is actually saying pen in there. Yeah, you can just about see it if I line it up with the pen. <laughs> uh, and I, I did a, uh, a couple of different uh, things to what Jake did as well. So if I get a Raspberry Pi Pico in the way, oh, geez. I wonder if I did it with the grey background, would it still work? Um, bad example. For white text on a white background. <laughs> Raspberry Pi Pico. Hold on. I'll tell you what I can do. Give it that and it might help. There you go. Oh, it's really disappointing when it's uh, it's overexposing. But I mean, you kind of you just about see uh, on there. But uh, it's really cool what you can what you can do with that. And obviously, then once you've got that working, it's just a Python script that's sitting there running on on the pi so you can and there's a dotnet sdk as well so um you can uh drive whatever you like with those um uh that those recognition recognized objects just like the the, uh, the texting idea that jake showed us there or opening a cat flap or whatever um i think it's it's yeah it's uh, it's pretty cool certainly as well the the amount of different things you can export to uh, so this was the export. So load connect. I'm not entirely sure, but oh yeah, that's right. So you can host it in the cloud, and the idea, um, oh, well not in the cloud, but uh, on on your local machine, I meant, and then you have a, a REST API on your local machine, and you can call into that REST API and have your local machine do the recognition rather than the Pi. So you offload that that more difficult data processing job to your local machine. Um, so that was that was quite cool different way of working i think interestingly the dotnet sdk version requires that you use this onyx export instead uh, which i don't think is quite as um uh sort of good on your processor as uh, as something like tensorflow light would be so um i can't get my words out tonight it is after nine o'clock after all um but <laughs> i when, just when... noticing in the in the chat as well where talk to me goose i love that uh i love that uh that name um that, that <laughs> talks to me a lot yeah uh yeah it takes me back to uh yeah the, the, the second film comes out soon doesn't it i hope so anyway well it keeps getting stops. put back um, keeps getting put back doesn't it? it keeps getting put back i know yeah. but it'd be nice if it comes out soon but anyway talk to me goose says that you don't actually need the hat you can do it with just a raspberry pi just a standard webcam and uh, and your Raspberry Pi. So um, and I suppose yes. that's true, really, because you don't even need a Raspberry Pi. You can do it on your laptop or your or your desktop PC. So um, yeah, if you don't want to buy the hat, but for thirty thirty pounds, I think it was, wasn't it? Um, yes, yeah, the, the like hat. That. It's yeah. not expensive. Yeah, thirty six pounds, I think it was. Um, you know, you're getting a uh, you're getting a, uh, a a hat. That's, you know, it's got the camera port. You, I think you still need to add the camera to that, though, don't you? Um, but it's got a little screen yes. on there and some buttons and things. So you know, it's a Fairly decent little hat. Um, yep. There's a couple of mics on there as well. Yeah, he's exactly. anything yeah. for made of fruit. You're right. Uh, anything it's got made of fruit gets my vote. Yeah. Hmm. Definitely. Yeah, it's good quality right. stuff. So I mean, the, uh, the the Loeb team there, Microsoft have worked with Adafruit to create this board. Um, yeah. Yeah. As Cliff says, he got this little IPS. I think it's IPS display on there. Um, yeah, IPS. Um, uh, which just means that you you can run it headless. You don't need the actual. Uh, to either SSH in theoretically uh, to yeah. be able to see what it is, but yeah, it's quite handy for that. Um, I like it, and I think there's a little, there's a little prototyping area as well on the top there. Um, you can see so uh, it's, you can you can take well not really prototyping, but uh, uh, breakout pins for you to be able to do different things. Oh, good! I, I, it looks like I put my fan on the right way. That's that's the way round I put my fan. Was that way round? So uh, it's not my fans never come on because I've set the temperature threshold to eighty degrees. I can actually feel that it is warm, but it's not as warm as this NVIDIA Jetson that's, that's to my right. That gets very hot. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get some time to play yeah, with that all, as well. All, 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 all the electricity has been used up for us to play toys, though. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's a good use of electricity in my book. Better than mining Bitcoin, yeah. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is there any other? Um, uh, I'd like to Living through train. the chat. I didn't see any other. Yeah, um, yeah talks me goose wants to build a uh, a mother-in-law detector. <laughs> yeah. I think that's an awesome use case. Um, yeah. You know, sound a big clacks and lock all the doors, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> Lasers, shutters. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're not in. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's cool. So, I mean, uh, that's Lobe. So, I'm trying to persuade um, uh, Jake to come on Nuts IoT actually and give a, a longer version of the session that he's just given there and a bit more detail about how it all works and uh, and that. So, um, hopefully, in the in the near future, we'll be able to get Jake on and um, maybe maybe somebody else from the team as well um, to talk yeah. about what it is they're doing. So, I think it's fantastic. Uh, it'd be, it'd be really so. cool to understand the, the the behind the scenes how it's all working you know how how they're doing all that training i'm assuming they're using you know azure and stuff it'd be microsoft but it'd be interesting to see how it's all built behind the scenes just out of you know curiosity really more than anything else yeah i'm um, not sure there's, there's, there's a there's a blog there somewhere that they've, they've written but we'll have to look at it yeah, i mean the, what's interesting is right. that um on, on this front page of the lobe site then they're, they're quite clearly in, sort of implying that, that they can do it against video, but Jake said not at the moment. So I'm guessing this is one of the features that they're working on uh, is having a video input into this, uh, the use part of the classifier to be able to do uh, video analysis, but also this cognitive uh, services type stuff, emotion analysis that they're hinting at there as well. I mean, I guess yeah. this is brand new. I think they, they uh, GA'd this product in October last year. So it's brand spanking new. I think they've had three big updates since then already. So they're iterating quite fast on this product. Yeah. Um, the thing well, I was just I was just thinking as well is the fact there's no Microsoft branded on there at all. No, and Carl Coase is just put he's put in the chat there. Is it part of Microsoft or are they just working together? But they bought it. They, really it's an acquisition. It. Yeah. It's an acquisition. He's, he mentioned when I was speaking right. to them that they, they acquired uh, Loeb. Uh, I think if you scroll right to the bottom, then you'll see. A product by Microsoft. So, um, yeah, but right. Right up until uh, relatively recently, this was a product all on their own. I mean, I saw this when um, uh, Cliff, were you? I'm not sure if you were on that. We did it. You were on that. We did a um, a, a cloud skills show with uh, Adam Jackson uh, from the UK yes. DevRel team uh, about IoT for good. Um, and but leading up to that, not actually on that show, I, I spoke to uh, Jen Fox. Uh, mm. And she was working on a trash categorizer, and I think she was using Lobe for that. So she yep. had a Raspberry Pi set up, and she'd use Lobe to train models of different types of trash. So it'd be like a plastic bottle, or a glass bottle, or uh, you know, a newspaper, or something like that. And she'd hold it up to the screen, and it would flash up one of three different colored LEDs to say which of the different trashes that that particular item needed to go in, because. Where she was, I think she's got like a communal recycling area and she'd go down and all the bins would be all full of all the wrong sort of trash because people just either didn't care or didn't know. Uh, and so she built that and that got picked up. There was on the Raspberry Pi website, that particular project. Um, but obviously there's, there's so many different uses uh, for something like this, but it's normally relatively difficult. It's not as hard as it used to be. Um, and I think Talk to Me Goose mentioned there um, as well that, yeah, you can do this. Uh, with the pie without the hat and stuff you could do this without lobe as well you could do it with tensorflow directly and um and train models yourself doing that uh, or you could do it with azure cognitive services but those are a step above this this is a lot easier um th there's still a, a lot of steps though to get this set up the way that you'd need it to, to be set up uh so um while i was doing it i was thinking that i'm, I'm pretty sure i could script a lot of this if not all of it, so that it would just be a single line install script. Those that know me know that I quite like single line install scripts. Uh, if you want to <laughs> unblock people, then then that's definitely the way to do it. And if you can get them to run a single script that does everything for you, then people are far more likely to do it. So uh, if I get some time, uh, then I'll perhaps look at that um, and make that a bit easier. Talk to me, you said I did this last year with my own work and it's a pain training models. Uh, yeah, it is, absolutely. Um, and there's custom... Uh, AI stuff that you can do in Azure as well that's that's not too bad uh, to train your own models and it's a very similar process to, to training it in Lobe where you just give it all of the images and label them yourself but this is so much easier uh, in Lobe. It's, um, it's a lot so, easier. I've, tr yeah. I've tried the, uh, the, the, the 
custom vision stuff in uh, cognitive services. And yeah, it's easy, but this is just, yeah, leaps and bounds easier. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Sort of stuff that you could quite happily take a couple of Raspberry Pis into a school and show it off to, to kids. Let's just yeah. make a you know rock, paper, scissors game and yep. that sort of thing and uh, get them interested in code. And it, yeah, it being Python, it's the code's not going to be massively difficult for them or I wouldn't have thought so um yeah this would be yeah I'm buying one of these uh, apps <laughs> as we, as we speak so I'm a bit distracted so there you go, there you go. Yeah. yeah I've I've dropped the link in the chat cliff you can just click the link <laughs> no I've got to pass that I'm I'm into the into the basket of uh oh, nice. Um, nice yeah so I've noticed there's a problem with your basket there though Pete it's empty yeah, you're um, right. That's because I yeah. keep buying things yeah. from it, and uh, divorce will yeah. loom if I keep, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's uh, a, a there's you can there's two different places as well that Jake didn't ca- uh, get a chance to mention. So there's a GitHub um, uh, over here. So if I save that, stick that there, put this in the chat. Uh, so that's this is where we've got the different bits of. So there's the the Adaf- Adafruit kit. But then there's the server, the 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 REST API type idea, and lobe.net, um, and the Android. I'm not quite sure if that's just a, a normal Android project or if it's a Xamarin Android project, Cliff. Um, but I'm guessing, as it says, Kotlin and Android Studio. Is uh, probably it's, yeah, just, it's, it's going to be a, a standard Android. Um, yeah, if it's in Kotlin, it's going to be standard Android. It's not even it going to be a Xamarin one. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but, a if a, if, uh, it, it, you know, it piqued my interest. As soon as you said that there's a .NET uh, yep. lobe.net which I think was the third or fourth one down there uh, fifth, yep. yeah there you go yep. Um, yep. if there's a lobe.net Xamarin is just .net so mm-hmm. I see no reason whatsoever um, you couldn't pull this into you know a standard Xamarin uh, project and uh, yeah it's using the Onyx format so I can't see any reason why you can't pull that into a Xamarin project and it'd be cross plat uh, and work on all your Xamarin um, hosts Obviously, yeah. it's not going to work on things like, you know, the, the, the ties and TV because, well, they don't have a camera. But, um, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, I wonder if you could fit a uh, the Tizen. Uh, Tizen is the um, is uh, is part of, is uh, the operating system from Samsung. Yeah. Um, they're so it's on all their, all their now, fridges. Aren't they, and... aren't they retiring Sorry? it or something? I thought they were retiring Tizen for some reason. I read somewhere that they were just getting rid of it again. I've and... not heard that. They're putting a lot of yeah. effort into it for, uh, for Xamarin and bringing what? it across to Maui. Um, I read about so uh, yeah, so it'd be you know you could have it on your fridge and uh, you know shout a bottle of milk and it, it adds it to the shopping list that sort of thing, um, you know oh. sort of just way better there. But yeah, I w- I'd be surprised if the the, the the oh badder they're retiring, which well, is the uh, badder it's, is it's watches. I'm thinking actually they're getting a bit of ties and off of oh, watches okay. and go to Wearos. That's what it was that I saw actually. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah Tizen's, you know, it's uh, it's fairly sort of, uh, yeah, big OS. So I suppose they're trying to sort of uh, shrink it down. It wouldn't surprise mm. me if they've just taken a subset of Tizen because it's, it's got quite a lot of stuff in there. So I dare say they've just stripped out the stuff to, to make it work on a small watch uh, better than it currently does. Yeah, uh, fair. But yeah. Uh, if the yeah. code's that easy, look at that. that. That's the .NET code to, um, to, to work with the low classifier look <laughs> oh wow that is super simple <laughs> wow cool, so yeah i like drop, that drop that link pete save me having oh, to yeah. type it in yep i'll do that um bearing in mind uh when i exported my tensorflow light model it was 100 meg uh so and i'm pretty sure that onyx isn't as slim down <laughs> maybe, as that so it might be quite big but yeah mobile phone's got loads of loads of space these days that's true we're good we're golden yeah Oh, Stick right, an SD card. I oh, know you can't do that anymore with modern mobiles, can you? Because they, they want you to buy a new one when you run out of memory. When you filled it up with photos. Export that. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, it doesn't like me doing that. Let's stick it in. Uh, I don't know where. Uh, I don't know. I'll stick it somewhere. What are we doing now? I'm going to export the Onyx model and see how big it is. Oh, <laughs> while right, it's okay. doing that. Uh, so while it's doing that, um there's there's also a lobe reddit so this is where i think they're doing a lot of their community interaction uh so i'm going to stick that in here as well and in on the links which are still on the screen in fact so um yeah go and join uh, the lobe reddit um uh, community there if you've got some questions 
uh, or, or feature suggestions or anything like that. Um, I have suggested as well that they, they create a Discord, or, uh, which would be quite nice, but I guess they're going to need to get to a critical mass to make that worthwhile manning. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it looks like there's, there's quite a few people um, using that. Check out these starter projects. Yeah, so um, could, could I use an NVIDIA Nano and Lobe? Um, yeah, I've got one there, so it'll be an interesting one. Um, and yeah, uh, but you mentioned... Be, be, oh, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. I was just going to say, it'd be interesting to know what the kind of smallest machine you could run it on you know could you run it on a pico for example rather than taking a picture of you could, well, well it does tend to play light doesn't it pico it does that's what i was just thinking tends to light works on the pico i'm just wondering if it'd mm. work you know or you're gonna be able to take a picture and then you're gonna wait half hour for the for it to crunch it and do numbers i don't know what what camera not sure are people using a camera on the pico is that what they're doing are they they got some sort of a what is it? Like you can use a camera. 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 It, it's just an I squared C you can use on is there. Um, right. But, but yeah. yeah, yeah, I've I've looked at doing that as well for for projects using the Pico and an I squared C. But um, yeah, it's you know. But then I've got I'm using the uh, PRJC uh, Tinsy boards and on the project at the moment, and they work great. So you know the 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 investment to move it across to a Pico for the saving in kind of what i think is 25 pound per board it just wasn't worth it um mm. so we just carry on using the uh the, the tinsy boards um because we know they work yeah fair so but yeah uh, so so um we've got 15 minutes left um so i thought i'd um show this jonathan ralph sent me this and i've not looked at what it is um but he sent me this in discord earlier and lvgl light and versatile graphics library and this is aimed at tiny boards look operate, operate with little memory 64k of ram so it feels a bit like wow. a gui front end for artos or something like that um fully yeah uh, i don't know if there's any uh, look so here's some examples of the devices look but esp32 is on there uh, the NRF uh, as well, um, which I've seen as yeah. microchip devices, um, STM. So they've, they've obviously done done quite a bit of work on that. Some online, online demos here, um, which I've, I mean, this, I, I literally got sent this earlier. So um, let me just pop a link to this. This is quite interesting, actually, isn't it? It is, yeah. I'll just stick, that's the GitHub, just there. Uh, so go back to that, um, and I'll just stick a link to this page as well. There we go, that. So uh, we can test LLVGL in the so a music player demo. <laughs> uh, printer demo. Look at that. That's cool. Widgets. It looks good, doesn't it? It does look very good. Then you can imagine that being used as a, to drive the print the screen on your printer. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. You know, yeah. It's, who's behind this? Click the about button. Uh, Top yeah. right. Let's do that. Uh, publish on GitHub. Uh, doesn't actually say a person, but if you click in, if you go go to the actual GitHub, then uh, this guy, I guess, uh, is involved. But there's quite a few people contributing. Uh, there we are, the author of yeah. L. And it's. What's it say? That's really, really impressive, actually. Um, it's, I mean, there's a commit eight hours ago, so it's quite an active. Uh... Mm. Active repo as well, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know if I'd be able to find this guy on Twitter. Um, look him up, but it'd be cool to get uh, this guy on the show because I'd not seen this yeah. before. And thanks to um, uh, uh, to to Jonathan Ralph for for pointing this out to me. And as I say, I didn't, I've not had a chance all day to look at it, so I thought I'd just save it. And uh, yeah, here, here it is. In fact, I found the guy on Twitter. So. Uh, if there's not very many people following him, so go and drop drop him a follow. Let me just stick a uh, link to his Twitter in there. So go and go and check out that as a project. So um, that seems cool. Um, I've got no idea how you go about getting started, uh, but there are some examples here. So I'm guessing maybe um, we can do that with this. I don't know. Looks like C, being as we've got .h files, styles, widgets, blah blah blah, music player. Oh yeah, printer. We saw keypad and encoder. I like it. So I mean, t to make a GUI with a with something like an ESP thirty two would be quite 
hand rather than normally think of gooey sort of like raspberry pie upwards don't you rather than yeah you do down, normally yeah down at the level of a, a microcontroller level so um yeah I'd, I'd like to i'd like to spend some time and have a look at that if i get some time number of stars on github so um yeah this is it's quite a nice quite a nice little website as well really boards in fact what's that saying certified boards look at this <laughs> i like it uh mxp oh yeah okay so three specific yeah, yeah. ones um but yeah only 512k flash yes. 200k ram look 16 meg of sd ram tiny devices mm, yeah cool so that's something for you to look very at. very impressive you get some time very impressive uh next yeah I'll, I was... I'll, 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 I'll do that i'll find more time yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris, <laughs> uh, Chris C. Swim has uh, has put in the chat. Have you heard of Arduino menu? Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't. That? Let's, no, have a look let's at that. Google that. Arduino menu. I would Google it, but you're quicker typing than me. Yeah, fair. So that looks like that's this. So let me stick a link to that here. Arduino menu. So what's this when it's at home then? Uh, fully automated user code driven navigation system uh, shout in the chat if we're not looking at the right thing um, small footprint for RAM so yeah it definitely falls under that same oh here we go some videos got some YouTube you won't be able to hear this I don't think but oh, maybe you will I don't know yeah, he says that's the one okay so they are four by uh, twenty, I guess LCD, uh, and I know from experience creating these menus can actually be quite complicated. So, so there's that. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, you'll have done a fair bit of that as well, of course, Cliff. But this looks like yes, it gets a bit uh, more complicated for for proper uh, LCDs. Ah. Yeah, I like that a lot, actually. Yeah. Someone's got the Hoover going. <laughs> Not the plan. A nice DC motor running. I like it. Oh, yeah. Ah, that's cool. Yeah, thanks for the shout out on that one. Time saver, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I have to uh, I've looked that up again. And uh, I am going to add. Uh, yeah. Oh, I have to go back. I'll add that to this collection for this week's episode. Uh, so I, I organised uh, these, the links that I find in, in collections. If we've not used collections before on IoT Edge, then it's worth doing if you do stuff like this, but any other thing, project basing, rather than um, uh, in sort of random, buried deep in your favourites there, you can um, uh, you can just add your current page to that and then you can open them all again later. Just seems like a nicer way of doing it. So that's cool. Um, and then uh, we're running out of time, 10 minutes left. Um, but while I was browsing around, as I'm often doing, browsing around on the docs, I came across this uh, Internet of Things architectures. And in fact, there's a bunch of other stuff in here. I've not seen this before. I, I was actually searching for uh, how to do Cosmos DB and IoT Central. Uh, and this came up and it's got like example architectures. So obviously we'll have all seen if you've done any amount of... Um, digging the IoT reference architecture uh, with your, your things on the left and uh, then your actions and your insights on the right-hand side there. Um, so, uh, the way that, around. That, well, yeah, I kind of went that way. Things, around, insights, yeah. actions. I know I, I yeah. think the same way as you and I always have to correct myself, but yeah. yeah it's, you're right. Um, but that goes through the whole topic there and it's actually quite cool. You see Cosmos DB mentioned here. Uh, but Project 15 is on there now. If you came along to Knots IoT, uh, like, uh, last week, then we had awesome. Sarah Maston. It was really, really good. Um, uh, it was really good. Was sad, sad thing is, I've only had time to watch it to where she's answering questions, um, right. and it, so I've not watched the, the the rest. It's on my to, like you know instant to do list, but I've just not had time. That yes. is an awesome, awesome talk. I highly really recommend good. if you've not seen it, go along, find it on YouTube, and uh, and watch I'll, it. I'll, it was, I'll put the yeah. link in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, it was that good. We had uh, Sarah Maston, who's from Microsoft Project 15, and we also had ha Alastair Davies, uh, who's from uh, Ari Ariba, uh, Ariba, something like that. I'm terrible at pronouncing the company that he's from, but he's working with uh, Whipsnade Zoo uh, to try and help um, 
uh, conflicts between humans and elephants, which normally it'd be poaching that you'd think about would be a problem with that. But you know, elephants often come into people's farms and they'll trample all over the the, the farm and, and ruin it. And of course, you know, sometimes then people and elephants can get injured just as a matter of course. And um, they're working with Whipsnade Zoo there to try and help, like with early warning systems, if there's elephants incoming to be able to, to do something, either klaxons to scare the elephants off or getting people out of the way so no one gets injured. Um so let's go. You see the sort of thing I watch on uh, on YouTube. Normally it'd be full of Peppa Pig because my daughter comes in and watch Peppa Pig on here. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, really. I, I do quite like Peppa Pig. Um, so here it is. That's the <laughs> link for. Oh, there's the link. Copy the link. I'll stick that in the chat. It's well worth watching uh, that particular yeah, episode. It's, it's definitely a brilliant, brilliant yeah. uh, episode. But yeah, Project 15 is a, it's an open source IoT architecture, if you will, that you can spin up. So they give you the, the ARM template to be able to spin up this, this reference architecture, uh, which looks like this. So it's huge, actually. It gives you a load of stuff. And I've actually spun that up uh, in, um, in my uh, subscription because I get you know, 10,000 quids worth or whatever of, of credits. I actually burnt through 5,000 quids worth. Uh, of my of my credits, I didn't realise. So, um, but then I how the hell did you do that? that? Yeah, you have to accidentally left something on, didn't you? That's what it was. Um, I, I keep spinning IoT hubs up, and you know, if you spin enough of them yeah. up, they start adding up. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that part of it was that. Uh, but yeah, so it, it provisions. In fact, I can show you if I go. If I, have I got it on open on another window? Hold on. Save having to load it up again. Nope. So I go to the portal. I'll show you the, the list of services that it spins up. Project 15. Is this just an yeah. ARM, tem ARM template that, it, yeah. that does it, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a bit more than that. You have to uh, do a setup script uh, after it. But yeah, practically it's just an ARM template. But if I hide the essentials, I'm giving it a bit more space. So you've got like an event grid here and digital twins and a DPS, device provisioning service, um, function apps. Uh, an IoT hub, obviously, maps, uh, signal R service, TSI, storage account. So it spins all of this wow. lot up and hooks it all together for you. Um, and then you can go to a uh, website, uh, which I can get from the app service plan somewhere. This one, app service. Boom, 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 boom. I think it's this one. No, it's being slow. Of course it's being slow. It's it's a demo, uh, but yeah, so it spins all of these bits up and, and hooks them together, and then there's an app service that then surfaces all of that lot. There we go. Should be able to go to that. If you don't use an app service for a while, it'll just put itself to sleep, uh, and yeah. so now it's spinning itself up is what it's doing there. There we go. Uh, so there won't be any data. Um, currently, so there's a map there, but um, if you're ingesting data, then the data would appear down at the bottom here, uh, and then you get a graph, uh, TSI uh, graph here of, of the data going along as well. So uh, I've not actually got any devices connected at the moment, but you can just use the Raspberry Pi simulator if you like, and you just need to tell it then uh, what, what telemetry um, you uh, uh, want tracking in there essentially so it's it's really cool um and i, I need to get uh sarah maston and her colleague whose name escapes me um on to to not so it again to give a more technical level uh talk about this this particular uh thing so yeah it was good to see that in in here but obviously the, there was other things as well so it's about the solution ideas look so there's condition monitoring in here and and there's so one of the things that this show is about uh, on a Thursday when we do it is the ability to be able to do solutions, end-to-end -end solutions. And this kind of speaks to that. And I've not seen this before. And I don't see a date on, on any of this. I don't know how long this has been here, but I don't remember Microsoft shouting about these different solutions. So IoT using Azure Data Explorer. And so... You know, they, they, they talk about the... Um, the, the you know IoT in a box and they? they talk about the the, the reference solutions um, but not not these ones the, this is more of a kind of a call out to here's one we built and you know this is how we built it kind of thing rather than a here's a here's a kind of a production line one that you tweak around the edges to make it work for you so yeah it's, it's a different use case 
I've not seen this this version, this way of doing it. No, I've not, and this is good. Uh, they need to be shouting more about this because, uh, like, they've got well, the full architecture. We, we, we know that the IT team don't shout very much, do they? No, we we do their shouting. Uh, it's fine. Yeah, we do. Um, yeah, we're, we're at, at the edges, <laughs> low power, low power people at the edges shouting very loudly. <laughs> exactly, edge processing. That's what we're yeah. doing there. So yeah, I thought that was that was fascinating. Uh, and then there's, uh, I found the, this Azure Cosmos DB IoT solution accelerator as well. Uh, and I, I didn't get a chance to look at it, but this looks like, you know, it's got a whole heap of stuff about how to get on with, with Azure Cosmos DB. Um, it helps what you quickly build a solution. There, what, connecting, connecting directly to, to Cosmos from an IoT or, or, or still using the IoT hub and then oh, yeah. IoT yeah, hub so yeah. pushing into... Yeah. Yes, you'd have IoT. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. So uh, I don't know if they give you an architecture there, but um, I don't know enough about Cosmos DB, and I really should do, uh, because as far as I was aware, it's, it's a graph database. Um, it's, but, it's a very, very simple you know, uh, database. You can just store, just store a blob of data in there, like blob storage, um, but you can then use SQL to query over it as well. Yeah, so that's what um, I didn't realize. So it's, yeah, it's very powerful, and it's also you know super fast, and you can... Um, share it across the world, across the different regions, and it will, um, you know, worry about making sure that if you do an ad of something in the US, um, it will become, you know, look at your chart there available in Europe. And if in Europe they delete that thing, it, you know, it worries and sorts out all the, the mm. conflicts. Um, yeah. and Have you used it out for you? So, yeah, yeah, I'm using it on a couple of projects at the moment. Uh, in fact, yeah. I was I was I was using it today. Um, doing some stuff of it today, connecting to yeah. it securely without any uh, without. I'm going to do a shameless plug now. Uh, doing <laughs> a um, doing it with um, uh, Christos from the 425 show. Um, oh, our really? talk on Thursday for the uh, Azure Live, isn't it? I think event um, is global about, Azure. Um, I've written a, yeah. global Azure. That's it. I've written a Xamarin app that connects to his. Azure AD instance, which <laughs> then allows me to just connect to Cosmos DB and um, pull down list of data or update list of data, but without any secrets anywhere. So I can quite happily commit to GitHub without risking me accidentally committing a uh, oh. a, uh, a, a secret key of any kind because th there is none. Um, they're all hidden away within Azure. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a, a cool talk. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean, deep is multiple models graph this year. So I think I'm missing one. Yeah, there's so many. Um, yeah. Rick, Rick really well. She's uh, is saying there's lots on there. So how do you um, connect from IoT Hub to Cosmos DB? Then you have to have something in the way. Is it, you have to have an Azure function. Or uh, I, I, I think you can probably just connect directly. Um, it's basically just like blob storage. Um, I'm not sure if Cosmos DB is one of the things you can connect on from. I yeah, think no, not... you can from IoT you... Hub. Can you? No, no, it's uh, service, service, it, bus it? Event, service bus, service event bus, event hub, and blob storage. I think they're blob the main storage, yeah. three routes that yeah. you can route out on. So you'd have to go to event hubs, yeah, uh, yeah or event service hubs bus. Out to, then... out to, yeah, I think you'd go event hubs then out to Cosmos DB. I think maybe. Yeah, I need to check it out because I've got clients that are using SQL Server. Uh, I specifically yeah. wanted SQL Server, and I'd not realised um, that you could query. Cosmos with SQL. Uh, I thought you were into yeah. stuff like MongoDB, uh, which obviously I think you can also use, uh, yeah. like a Mongo type language, can't you? Um, so I didn't realize. Yeah. The thing I like SQL. about it, the thing I like about it is the fact that you can just chuck any blob of data at it. Uh, uh, you know, effectively stores it as JSON, uh, and you just chuck the data at it, and it doesn't need to fit the rows and columns um, that are in an SQL database. You can just mm. chuck the data at it and then query it later. So rather than Oh no, we missed out this 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 column that we need to track. Uh, uh, you know, uh, is, is still employed column, um, and uh, we need to add it in, and then all that sort of stuff goes on. You can literally just add it into the next data set that's sent up, and and remove it from one a month later. And when you do an SQL query, it just finds that data. So, so can I can um, I do a query for uh, the all of the data for a device between two dates, assuming that those columns exist? Can you do that sort of a query? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you can do that sort of oh. query. Yeah, you can have all that sort of data in there as well. It's very, yeah. very powerful. Um, it, I mean, I'm just scratching the surface what I mentioned about it, but yeah, it's very good. Um, uh, Chris, yes, Swim says Cosmos DB. Yeah. So Microsoft, Microsoft answer to uh, MongoDB, it pretty much is really. Um, 
I think it's, you know, Microsoft probably couldn't buy Mongo, so I thought they'd go and do it themselves. <laughs> but, I, mean, I don't I've know, watched, but yeah, I've, it's, it is. Yeah. I've, I've watched Kev Smith's talks on MongoDB and querying over MongoDB was complicated. Uh, it was, it was, yeah, yeah. The language to be able to do it was hard because it was like a flat file structure, if you will. It was, it's not a relational database. So they're they're building SQL over the top of that Cosmos DB, which sounds a bit like the the cool stuff they've done with Digital Twins, which is also a graph, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so it's you know there's GraphQL as well, isn't it? That's that's going to be a similar sort of thing. So yeah, I just don't know enough about it's, this. It's, I need to have a play. Yeah. I only know about it because the last couple of months we've been working on a project where it was, we, we don't know what we wanted. We, or when we started the project, we didn't know what we needed to store uh, and how it was going to store it. Um, so I thought, so well, I'll just chuck it in Cosmos because I can just store anything then and worry about it later. And the idea was that I was eventually going to, from the what was in the database, work out what columns and rows I needed in SQL database. Actually, yeah. it's so simple. I'm just going to stick with Cosmos, and the the client's happy. Well, they really don't know what a database is, but um, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> it's easy. I can just pick the one that works for me. And what about, the, what about the, cost the though? Is, is, it, is it mega expensive? Because it used to be mega no, expensive, no, it's didn't it? Super, super cheap now. In fact, actually, you get um, I can't remember where it is now. You get a is a free tier, um, and as long as you're not above that number of queries per month, it's free. Right. I mean, Dave Roday is um, saying so, yeah, that, that, that you can just yeah. go from IoT Hub to Stream Analytics and then from Stream Analytics to uh, Cosmos. I suppose you could go, yeah, 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 Stream Analytics, yeah, you could do it that way. Stream Analytics is um, expensive, I think. Yeah. That's the only downside. Yeah. Uh, Event Hub might be a cheaper option, I suppose, but yeah. Um, but you can have things like stored stored procedures as well and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's... Uh. It's very, very powerful, uh, and I've not even barely scratched the surface. Um, yeah, uh, global replication is costly. Yeah, Dave R four 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 four. Is that enough force? I don't know. Um, yeah, he's uh, <laughs> that's does, Dave does Rodea. Get, He's yeah. awesome. He comes along to the not IoT every now and again. Yeah, um, global uh, global replication is costly, um, but yeah, it's you're only going to use that if you're making a lot of money anyway, aren't you? Because um, then you're going to be worrying about your your clients in different regions. Um, you know, and you're going to be you're going to be worrying then about the the millisecond delays um, and latency across the world. But if you've got that problem, um, I think you're doing quite well. So you could probably yeah. afford to pay the bill, um, which is probably how Microsoft have priced it. But yeah. yeah but we've okay. digressed from IoT. We've moved away from IoT. Not really. No, this is the the storage platform for IoT, as far as I'm aware. So nothing wrong with that. Well, okay. um, oh, yeah. there, there's this here, IoT for sustainability as well, which I've not spotted before. Uh, and uh, Sarah Maston put me onto this one, um, build a more environmentally sustainable future with Azure IoT. So there's Project 15 again, obviously, and there's some architectures there, Project 15 smart meter monitoring, solar panel monitoring, which would be of interest to uh, one of my clients who is doing exactly that. And interestingly, they are using IoT Central, which is what I'm using. Uh, and then uh, they're going out, I don't quite know what they're going out to there, but there's an Azure function I can see in the way, and a SQL DB, Azure SQL DB, which is... And Azure Data Lake storage as well, which, I've, again, that's something else I've not looked at, is Azure Data Lake uh, and to see what that's all about. Um, so, yeah, this is what I'm doing for a client is exactly that same sort of thing. Uh, connected Waste Management. So what I liked about this, again, is that this these are solutions. And I think this is how Microsoft are going to have to spend some of their time and money is, is giving people this solution-based architecture. IoT Central is obviously fantastic for that, and you get templates for solutions. Uh, but if you could do something like this for the the basic services, like Project 15 is, is doing there, to because you're stuck in IoT Central. You can't bring your own IoT hub. If you want to get the data out, then you're into exporting it onto an event uh, event hub or event bus rather, or uh, service bus or any of those different event hubs, service bus, um, and then writing your own code after that. So it just kind of feels like you're a little bit stuck uh, when you're in there. Uh, and there's there's Project 15, um, and that was that Adafruit stuff from earlier. Yeah, so I think we've been through all the links that I wanted to go through uh, today. Um, and that was good. So, um, yeah, uh, and... We've got had quite a few um, stepping out of it, Rick stepping out as well. So uh, yeah, it's yeah. ten past ten past ten here. So I'm going to go and see the wife. I think I'm going to see Amy and see uh, see if she's still there. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go and check. My my wife had her COVID jab this morning, so um, oh, okay, she's cool. looking a bit rope. Well, she wasn't looking a bit ropey. I'll take that back because this is live and it's being recorded, and she'll come and kill me later. Um, maybe. but she's feeling a bit ropey. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I'm gonna go and check that she's okay and and maybe sort of uh, yeah, make sure she's tucked off but I'm into bed with a mug of milk or something. I had no um, ill effects. Yeah. I, I didn't have any side effects other than a slightly sore arm. I had nothing weirdly. No, I felt absolutely bush like i if i sat oh. down i fell asleep it was as simple as that but right. literally 24 hours and after that i was fine and she's feeling a bit mm. as if she said earlier about an hour or two ago that she uh she uh was feeling like she's got a cold coming on um right. and that's how she felt but yeah yeah mm. we'll see oh, yeah so well, good luck to her cool bye yeah, nice to see you. Thanks to everyone for coming. Um, we will be back yep. next Tuesday. In a, in a couple of weeks' time, we are going to hopefully have Paul DiCarlo uh, come on and we're going to play with this NVIDIA Jetson uh, that both me and Cliff have got uh, beside us. So that's uh, that's uh, on the list of things to do. And I'm also trying to p- persuade Pamela Cortez to come on and do something similar uh, as well. So uh, anyone I can speak to, really, I'm just trying to persuade them to come yeah. on and, and do pa- some Pamela, similar Pamela Gaben awesome talk uh i hear at the um girls at code um yes yeah. girls who code isn't it um, girls the into other coding. day girls yeah um it'd be cool to to kind of see that uh, that talk because you know obviously mm. it was it was um you know a, a, a great talk but um didn't get to yeah. see it sadly um but yeah that'd be a cool talk to to, to hear um yeah, she's got a lot of energy so yeah pamela's awesome one of my fave people from yeah. microsoft Cool. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming and we will catch you again next week. See you later. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. Good night.